homeopathic suicide attempt. However, it, it's really not our place to make light of such a serious subject, so it's just simply the homeopathic overdosing attempt. We're going to see what we can do if we can overdose on some homeopathic sleeping tablets. A little background. Here is the fly associated not just come out here, with the pills that we're going to take. And I bring your attention, uh, it's all very interesting reading, of course, but I bring your attention to the part where, near where it's circled, which says, uh, brow natural medicines use homeopathic ingredients which are effective and uh, provide relief of specific symptoms, have no known after effects, and an excellent safety report. No known after effects. The side effects is another way to look at that. That's what the front of the box looks like. And there's the real one. We went to the pharmacy yesterday and bought some uh, right off the pharmacy shelf. This is the official line from the company, the Brow Company in South Australia, as you can see. Most of the ingredients in Brow products are homeopathic, which means in most cases, that uh, means that they're far too dilute to cause an overdose. And it's also why they're not known to cause serious side effects. So they're not known to cause serious side effects. And the other fly said no known after effects or side effects. Side effects of this product are pretty rare. <laughs> Usually about one person in around 10 to 20,000. <laughs> I've got to wonder about that. So, Constipation, eh? Okay. Transient. Transient. <laughs> the best kind. Right. Okay, now I, I asked the company what's in these pills. Because I don't for one moment believe that the, the list of ingredients, the homeopathic ingredients, are actually in the pills themselves. So we've got some uh, consistent, mostly of water, uh, honey, alcohol, potassium, uh, lemon juice, sugar extract. And it says, brow sleep and insomnia relief, uh, due to the strengths of the ingredients and the claims made on the product, is exempt from TGA regulation and therefore requires no listing or registration. When you buy medicine in the pharmacy, you look at the, the packet, it should say OST R or OST L. It's the TGA stamp on it. And if something is exempt from it or it doesn't need it, then there's simply nothing there for the TGA to, to list or register or worry about. No ingredients. There's a close-up on the packet, the ingredients listed on the packet. Now, uh, Steve Roberts, who will be speaking after me, will go into large numbers for you. The C stands for a century, a hundred. The ingredients listed there, and coffee's listed twice, in two different delusions. Uh, delusions? <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> and all sorts of other things that, again, the 3C and the 14C and the 30C will ex be explained to you. Suffice it to say, these are huge, huge numbers we're dealing with. We're talking about uh, the fact that long since the molecules of anything that might have been there, which we seriously doubt have long gone from the, from the product. When uh, I bought some of these pills from the pharmacy, the attendant at the pharmacy assured me uh, the home homeopathy was not scientific. <laughs> and I really had to take a double think. She, she really said that. It's okay, they're not scientific. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, you can safely take the whole pack of sleeping pills, have no side effects and not overdose. No, not overdose. This is a pharmacy. Now, I don't know about you, but I have always regarded chemists and pharmacies with a certain level of respect in our society. And here's somebody representing a pharmacy telling me that I can consume an entire box of sleeping tablets and have no uh, after effects, no, no chance of overdosing, no nothing. I guess we'll come back for another box. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and, and I uh, went to another pharmacy and was buying some legitimate medicine and I said to the, to the, tenant, the pharmacist, what do you think about this homeopathic stuff being sold here? And she said, it works because the pills have the energy of, the, of the, the substance that once was in them. And then she said, but I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm doing a course in homeopathy at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time to put it to the test. 
Are you allowed to take it if you're on a diet? <laughs> it's an, I'm on a homeopathic diet. <laughs> These are the sleeping uh, the, the packet. I just took the, the little pills out. Recommended dosage. Uh, adults, two tablets. Children, uh, two to twelve, one tablet. Now, if you think about that for a second, they're recommending, because in the homeopathic world, if something's weaker, it actually has more effect on you. <laughs> I think you see my point. They're telling people to give their children a stronger dosage than their adults. Take water tablet. Homeopathic kids are bastards. I think the only way to overdose it now is like this. <laughs> I invite Barry Williams, Peter Bowditch, uh, to join me on stage. Colin, would you care to put your life on the line? Dr. Phil, our special guest. Okay. you feel like committing suicide? You don't get speakers. registration number 14795 and throat lozenges. Right. That's got to be, they've got an R on it because they had to actually prove these things work. Because they might be so dangerous. If you don't have that one, it's looking at Okay, I invite you gentlemen to pop out every single pill. They're going to take uh, an overdose of 10 times, 20 Under pills dose. each. Or is that an underdose? This is how it works. I'll be with the rest of you during my talk. <laughs> Exactly. I, I noticed on the box it said also store under 30 C. <laughs> <laughs> you can safely store these in the core of the sun and it'll be <laughs> Slide to show you a couple. Can I ask? 
But so if you diluted it enough, the effect will still be made. And if you use filthy enough uh, glassware and whatnot, you can keep the effect going. Uh, that was a, a thing in Germany. Um, um, homeopathy took its place among all the uh, beliefs of the day, and it was restored later by the father and son team with the surname of Palmer. And they were um, very um, strong advocates of homeopathy. They were also extremely intolerant and would not book any kind of criticism. Uh, this was about 1840. And homeopathists would go back to these people. And, and in fact, they formed at various camps. I mean, there are homeopathists who adhere to Harneman who wrote a book which was in six editions, and the fifth edition was the leading Bible. The sixth one was published after he died, and some people like the sixth one. And there's probably a war between fifth and sixth edition type homeopathists. And, um, other homeopathists like to uh, insist on administering only one cure, observing the patient, but yet other groups administer many cures at once. And there's a big dispute between these about polypharmacy. Um, can you dish out lots of things at once? Uh, um, it's all a big laugh, and uh, uh, that actually completes my um, summary of the history of homeopathy. I was going to spend the rest of the talk um, showing you some big numbers and giving you a couple of laughs. Uh, I do like a laugh, but unfortunately, you get this sort of stuff going on. People trying to cure hepatitis with homeopathy. Just as you say, it cures it. You know, if you go and buy this stuff, and you could buy this stuff until the skeptics had it uh, banned, um, uh, there's a rather ghastly side to it. But I mean, that, that's a secondary effect of homeopathy. Um, I much prefer remedies like this one. This is hydrofluoric acid taken through a homeopathic web page, and you see there. Um, uh, floor act, and it must give it a Latin name or a Latin sounding name, even though it wasn't actually known to the Romans. Um, <laughs> just as well, um, hydrofluoric acid, for those who don't know, etches glass. Actually, you actually give, you, it actually dissolves glass, it's so strong. Um, so I do prefer to take mine in a homeopathic form. <laughs> 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 um, you know. uh, yeah. Um, what we really need, really, is homeopathic scepticism. Scepticism as possible. Um, <laughs> right, just keep going. Um, yeah, so I went to the homeopathic shop, and I, my mate recommended a particular remedy. You get one called Universal Remedy, which cured everything. And I said, stop saying that. It's a great pity, because you know, we don't decide anything else. Anyway, um, uh, my mate recommended the bottle of uh, this stuff, so I bought a bottle of it. And um, I was going to take it, but unfortunately I, I walked over Sydney Harbour Bridge, but it was very windy, I was looking at the jar, and I dropped the damn thing into Sydney Harbour. Um, <laughs> what a pity. Anyway, look, never mind, I mean, you, you, now all of you can enjoy it, you know. <laughs> 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 I, I, I told my mate this, and my mate's got a boat, it's quite a big boat, it's got rats on it, and he had this jar of rat poison for poisoning the bats, and uh, that fell off the boat in the Sydney Harbour as well. So, um, you know, really I can't, um, really can't recommend that. Um, so I, I, I went back to the shop to get another jar, and I thought, well, actually, rather than buy the jar and take the pills, I'll just keep the jar up. So I just sort of held, held the pills, and, um, well, a few molecules get out, you know, and um, well, it felt a lot better. So um, <laughs> that's the thing you can do. <laughs> so um, you can just go in the shop and just, just hold the jar. Oh, in fact, um, the following week, I got as far as the outside of the shop, and I thought, well, I was no real need to go in. <laughs> um, this was in Melbourne and now I'm in Sydney and I feel much better still. So. <laughs> there are uh, some more pictures. Uh, we have here. Is that jar of sound moving around? Okay. Um, these are from homeopathic web pages. I've taken all the web furniture off. but. Um, a uh, lot of homeopaths agree on dosage and potency. Potency is how much it's diluted by. And those figures 30C to 200C, a dilution of 1C is a dilution of 100 times. The dilution of 2C is where you do that twice, so it's actually 10,000 times. Then you get involved in some maths, and I, well, I will lose all of you doing this talk with mathematics, I, I assure you. <coughs> so 30C is, um, 10, is 100 to the power 30, okay? Not 30 hundred, but um, <clears throat> 10 to the power 60, uh, a, one with, a one with 60 zeros after it. Um, that's just the low stuff, the 200 C, which those vaccines were, is even more dilute. Uh, so you, you should treat uh, chronic illnesses with high numbers, but acute illnesses uh, with low numbers. 
Uh, but <coughs> simply, especially for accidents, start off the symptoms, in which case you might want to think of you know, the high numbers first, or maybe it depends what the accident was, but maybe, maybe try other remedies like hospital or, you know. <laughs> 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 you know I broke my leg and then we'll. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> two things on this if you're not sure which remedy to take, use an potency. Um, and observe the patient carefully, because it's obviously one of these red pages that insists on one treatment only. To administer this, you observe the poor patient who might, you know, improve but might go down and down in health as you do the observing. Um, and dish out in a later higher potency. Uh, in the first paragraph, if after taking the low potency remedy, reef is not felt, a different remedy should be taken in a low potency. So it doesn't matter which one you take. <laughs> you go to the shop and buy the cheapest one. Suck the blue, that's terrible. Um, really high potency is so normally taken in very low doses. <laughs> Tell me once per week, or as I would recommend, not at all. Is it generally considered to be a bad idea to take high potencies often? Well, I hardly want to meet it through the talk. <laughs> this is from an Irish homeopathic page, and the underlying bit is of interest. It says, however, in France, the law does not permit the use of homeopathic remedy to exceed 30C, which is considered high potency. I think the French have a bit of, um, bit of an advantage on this. Um, Further on the same Irish web page, <coughs> Dr. Lalu, good Irish name that. Um, this is their memory, and the, the, the LM means 50,000. And in Harleman's sixth volume, he invented, he discovered the dilution of 1 in 50,000. So um, LM1, which is antibacterial acute, I'm saying, how this there. Oh, that's 1 in 50,000 dilute, and if you dilute that 1 in 50,000 to make antibacterial chronic, um, that's 1 in 50,000 squared, which will be 25 times 10 to the 8. Oh, you'll see bigger numbers, you see bigger numbers here. Um, and um, there's a, some bizarre things here. For start, these are all have different dilutions for different diseases, and what they're actually selling there, they're actually selling the same stuff for all these diseases. <coughs> it's diluted differently, you know, and you couldn't how diluted it is, you get different things. Now, if you, if you look under uh, eczema in the first, first column, that's LM11, and after that, Envino Detox is also LM11, they made a bit of a mistake there. <laughs> so if you buy the LM11 stuff, you actually get two cures. <laughs> if, you, if you have an eye, uh, LM38 will cure that. Piles, <laughs> 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 of course, the bottom down 85 for piles. Because that's really strong stuff. Um, old age, and then 27. <laughs> I, 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 I bought some of that, but actually I left it out in the sun and it evaporated and became an M26. Memory, um, I think. Um, anyway, um, how can they make this stuff? You, you buy a machine. Um, um, you think one of them, when they make the LM27, you start with the LM26, you've got that far on the chain, you take a little bit of LM26, you dilute it 1 in 50,000, and it gives you LM27. So actually 49,999 times as much of LM27 <laughs> has gone down the sink compared to what you've got left. So, um, you know, the stuff that goes down the drains must be all of these things uh, for the dilution before in vast quantities. Um, so that's uh, a way of doing it. Obviously, they're keen on selling this. And in fact, in the splurge at the top, in the paragraph, they say a bacterial infection could combine LM78 antibacterial, LM5 temperature, and LM81 pain. Uh, LM78 antibacterial is quite good, but actually, if you look in the column, the fourth entry down in the third column, LM78 is arthritis acute. Um, and, 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 and antibacterial is actually LM1. So there's a. Um, what the hell? <laughs> what we need is homeopathy. Um, this really works. This is where you take the belief in homeopathy and dilute it very, very much. So as each day goes along, you give less and less credence to homeopathy. And um, when, the, when you've diluted it so much that all the belief has gone away, um, you'll be much healthier. <laughs> so let's look at some big numbers. As those of you who do know me, I, work for, I used to work for banks. I used to be a code maker. And, um, I'm in Melbourne, I have my own testing laboratory, and I'm used to handling big numbers. And 
what's his name's number, BN, BNVS number is nothing compared to what I handle every day. In fact, what you handle every day, when you surf on a website, you are dealing with numbers which are much, 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 much bigger than the BNVS number, which was um, n to the power of n, where n was 10 to the 23. Um, the SSL website will use RSA keys that have uh, n to the n, where n is about 10 to the 150. And your computer can handle that. There are shortcuts I have to add. You know. um, so let's have a look at the names of big numbers. This is rather interesting. These are the official names, you know, kilo, mega, and so on for numbers of things. And um, the amazing thing is that some of these are quite recent. Um, the prefix Terra for 12, 10 to the 12, T R A, that was only invented in 1964. Actually, the first time I saw the word Terra bit, I was so amazed by it, but I sort of just stared at it. This was in 1982, I can tell you. And so we spoke about a terabit computer, and I thought, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it had a hard drive for it, really. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm sure now people will be laughing. This machine here in front of you is a terabit computer. It has a you know, 160 gig hard drive, and that's a terabit. And in five years' time, people were saying, oh, you're a computer with bits that went round and round. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother threw one away. You know. <laughs> um, but the next prefix is down, PETA and EXA. We were invented in 1975, and the ones after that, Zeta and Yotta, which you haven't heard of yet, but they were designated in 1991. And um, they haven't really come into use yet, because we don't have that many of things, but um, you've seen Mega and Giga a lot in computing. Terra's creeping in, and PETA is it's in science fiction and so on. Um, beyond Zeta and Yotta, we didn't really know what, what to do next, and somebody proposed Groucho and Harper. <laughs> 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 but um, okay, let's have Zeno or Zenta, with a T sometimes, and we'll go back up the alphabet. So we've got Z, Y, we'll make an X, we'll go back up the alphabet and append a name like uh, the, in Zeta, uh, Ector is 7 and Otto is 8 and Enum is like 9 and, um, and so on. Ven Vendica, uh, Endeca is 11. Um, back up the alphabet's fine, but the French don't have a W, so there's, we're going to fight wars over this as well. So. And the French say, oh, but the, the V is before the X. The point is that science runs out, you know, when you get to 10 to the 30, science has no expression for it. You know, nobody's ever needed a word for 10 to the 30 of something. That's a one with 30 zeros after it. Um, so I need to show some big numbers. I do like big numbers. Here we go, because big numbers. The number of people who have ever lived over all time, well, at least since 55,000 BC, about 96 billion, according to my estimate. We've got 6 billion alive now. It's actually surprisingly a lot, you know, and the people before that and going back over lots of time with a reasonable population, not the creationist model. 96 billion people who have ever lived. 96,000 million. The Americans won that particular war. Uh, <laughs> 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 Other things. Um, 100 billion is the biggest number in a pop song. And you can guess, I'll tell you at the end what song it is, but if you want to spend the rest of the talk thinking about what song has the word 100 billion in it. The, oh, point, the, 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 the point being that this is the biggest number you can present to the public who listen to pop song lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> um, 500 billion is the biggest number on a banknote. Uh, in Yugoslavia when there's rampant inflation. There's been some near ones to that, you know, when the people carry money around in laundry baskets and you leave it in the street. This happened in Germany in 1923. You leave it in the street and somebody tipped all the money out and nicked the basket. <laughs> 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 Finally, the million, only double that. Finally, the million is five times ten to the eleven. Well, one in ten to the twelve is the proportion of sea water which is gold. And actually, we're putting up the proportion of sea water slide later on, but if you take 10 to the 12 litres of seawater, which is a, a cubic kilometre, um, you have one litre of gold you know, it's scattered in that. Now, have you ever seen a cubic kilometre? It's big, it's really scary, a cubic kilometre. It's a kilometre high, and a kilometre wide, and a kilometre deep. And if you go to look at Sydney Harbour, you'll see half a cubic kilometre for the whole contents of Sydney Harbour. So actually in Sydney Harbour, we have about half a litre of gold, which turns out to be worth about $220,000. So if you can get all the gold, that's, that's assuming it was seawater. That's actually fresh water flows in. Um, but um, $220,000 sounds like a lot of money, but you, you try and extract it from, you know, if you start distilling, you watch your electricity bill go up. <laughs> actually, there's much more because, uh, as Ian Palmer, the pioneer, the work, there's gold in shit. 
That's a lot of gold in shit. Um, if you process sewage, you get much, much more than 1 in 10 to the 12 gold from duly wearing off, and you'll be better off spending your time processing sewage for gold. Um, more numbers. Um, 80 petameters of distance to Sirius, the star Sirius. Um, it's uh, nine light years. Uh, and I don't like years when I was a kid. It's eight, eight times 10 to the 16 meters, uh, 80 petameters, petameters, pronounced, pronounced. Um, and four times 10 to the 19 combinations of Rubik's Cube. <laughs> now, we've already left, we've, we've had now to leave behind measuring things. There's nothing more we can measure beyond a Sirius. Um, we, we can't measure anything coherently anymore. We're going to have to start counting things instead. Later we'll be counting combinations of things. Um, four times 10 to the 19, on the packet of Rubik's Cube, it said over 3 billion combinations. Well, it's not. It's actually 42 quintillion combinations, but the public are so stupid that you can't put 42 quintillion. <laughs> it's about 3 billion, and then it's sold, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's purely a lie. It's just that 3 billion was a figure they thought the public would understand. <laughs> mm. <laughs> stars of the universe, 10 to the 22nd. If you go out at night with a clear sky, and if you see all the sky and you have perfect vision, you would see 10 to the power 11 stars. Um, that's um, 100,000 million stars. And they're all in our own galaxy. And actually it turns out that about half those stars are actually not stars, but they're other galaxies. So if you multiply up the stars in those galaxies, it's the square of 10 to the 11, a bit more than that in fact. So the stars in the universe that we can observe, counting galaxies as we understand them, is that many. Um, which is a lot, but actually, Avogadro's number is about the same, 6 times 10 to the 23rd. Well, that's a factor of 10. If you take 12 grams of carbon, or <coughs> you know, uh, 2 grams of H2, or 16 gram, or 32 grams of oxygen, O2, the number of atoms or molecules in it will be that number. It's the same for any element. This is the number raised to the power of itself, which BM Benis wants to claim for himself. And um, uh, I just have to say, in cryptography, you get big numbers of that. Actually, in theoretical chemistry, which I also studied for my degrees, you get far bigger numbers than that. Uh, there's a branch called statistical thermodynamics where you regularly deal with numbers like the factorial of that. You know, factorial 10 is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 down to 1. So you take that number times 1 less than that, times 1 less than that. The factorial of it you can reasonably handle on a paper, and it's big, big, big but you multiply it all out from the end. Uh, so that's how many atoms there are in stuff. In the human body, if it's tubby enough, 10 to the 28 atoms, you know, trouble the molecules up in atoms for an adult male human body, reasonably hefty. That's uh, how many atoms. And my own field, cryptography. The 10 to the 33, the answer to the cryptographer's prayer. Oh God, oh Lord of big numbers and large things, just grant me the power to compete 10 to the 33 operations. If I could do that, I could nick all the money in all the banks in the world right away. And you'd all wake up this tomorrow morning, poor me, and all the money would be in my account. <laughs> <laughs> Just deliver that number to me, you know. I've got a homeopathic bank account. <laughs> <laughs> um, two more things. The plank length and the plank time. These are actually the smallest the smallest length and the shortest time that you can possibly address in physics. You know, 10 to the minus 43 of a second, or 1 10 to the 43rd of a second. Physics doesn't go below that. It all becomes totally fuzzy and woolly and meaningless. Um, you, you can't, there's no real concept of anything smaller than that because of um, quantum, quantum physics. I don't want to get tied up in that. But you, you really can't have numbers smaller than those in actual physics. Um, and actually, there's another combination here, putting chess pieces on the chessboard. This is tipping them out of the box and putting them on whatever square you like. It gives them very bizarre positions, but 10 to the 42 of them. For Japanese go, it's 10 to the 170, so, you know, that's more complex. There's far fewer chess games than that. Um, Suppose you measure the whole universe, the radius, you know, the distance across the universe, the diameter of the universe, in plank lengths, not meters, in plank lengths, 10 to the 61. So you can't have anything bigger than 10 to the 61, anything. You know, the biggest object there is, with the shortest measurement you can measure it with, is that. <laughs> uh, okay, 10 to 61, you know. Um, the number of atoms, uh, that's a measurement, right? Number, 
No, that was in the university, Eddington number, and Eddington, to his shame, actually published the exact number, which was 136 times 10 to, times 2 to the 256, which is about that. <laughs> and he was about right, but not right as much as it was the exact number that every last atom counted. Uh, but the consensus among scientists is 10 to the 78 to 10 to the 80. And I was horrified to hear somebody earlier say it's 10 to the 81. Ah, it's not, it's in that range somewhere. The number of atoms in the universe is about that many, so... Oh, okay, yeah, well, there it is. Um, so, suppose you fill the universe, the big, um, you go to three dimensions, and you fill the universe with the smallest thing you can find, you use subatomic particles, actually you break it up and use quarks, they have a size, believe it or not, and you fill the whole universe with quarks without any spaces in between the quarks. Because <laughs> if you know anything about atomic structures, there's a lot of space inside an atom. Well, if you fill all that space, so there's no room to squirt any more quarks in, it'd be 10 to the 110 quarks in the universe. So you really can't possess more than 10 to the 110 objects of anything. <coughs> This leads us to the frivolous theorem of mathematics. It's a real theorem, which says that almost all numbers are very, very, very large. <laughs> which means if you pick a random number, and I pick a random number, then mine is certain to be much bigger than yours. And actually, also yours are certain to be much bigger than mine, if there's no limit on the numbers. Then this theorem is not very useful, that's why it's called that. <laughs> uh, now, um, when, they, when they dilute these pills with stuff, um, what kind of stuff you dilute it with? Well, look at seawater. This is actually um, New Zealand's seawater. But it contains hydrogen and oxygen, which the water is made of. These add to more than a million because you're measuring milligrams per litre, and a litre is more than, more than 1,000 grams of seawater. It's about 1.03 times that. Uh, sodium chlorine, magnesium, sulphur, the common elements. Um, helium in seawater, about one part in 10 to 12 of helium. Beautiful stuff. Uh, then New Zealand seawater. <laughs> helium, sorry, helium. <laughs> and you can find ten times as much gold as that figure of helium. Ten, if you multiply that by, by ten, that's how much gold there is in seawater. Multiply that again by ten, that's how much mercury there is in it, naturally occurring mercury. You multiply that again by twenty, that's how much uranium there is in seawater. It's um, uh, 3,000 parts per billion uranium. And actually, come to think of it, you know, one percent of that is uranium two three five. So if you did try and extract the gold from seawater, so you'd have a, a slight problem when you got um, near to getting the gold. You have a slight problem involving uranium two three five. <laughs> so um, I really wouldn't advise trying that. Um, if you buy bottled water, um, some of it is very pure, some of it is amazingly hard for water. Uh, Evian water from France is three hundred parts per million. So you're looking at uh, of solids, so about as much as there is of calcium in seawater is what there is of all the solids in bottled water. Well, the purest bottled water is probably nature's spring, that's 24 parts per million. That's still a good chunky figure, um, and there'll be more things down below that. Um, tap water will be somewhere in between those two figures. Now, so people say, okay, we'll take distilled water. Um, the problem with distilled water is it still contains lots of stuff. It's saturated in oxygen for a start. Um, oxygen is awful stuff chemically, and you really wouldn't work with distilled water in a chemistry lab. You'd avoid water coming in altogether. Um, it's got stuff off the glass. The glass itself dissolves a little bit. The, the glass probably got a couple of molecules of de detergent stuck to it the last time it was washed. And um, distilled water would not be thought to be clean in the sense of the clean rooms where they make silicon chips. And guys go around in space suits and they make these silicon wafers. If you bought distilled water in there, they'd say, that is not clean. Take it out of here. The resistance in the water is one ohm per centimetre, for example, if it's distilled. It's hardly any resistance if it's got salts, but one ohm per centimetre in clean water. But it should be much higher than that. You know, the resistance should be 50,000 ohms per centimetre, something like that. So you've actually got homeopathically proportioned substances in distilled water before you start making your cures. Uh, let's have a look at what somebody's selling. Back to homeopathy, this is what Harman Laboratories sell. They have a web, web page with oodles of memories from A to Z. And under H we find these things. These are the memories and the concentrations, the dilutions they're sold in. Um, 100 C, 500 C at the top. That's, um, C is 100 times diluted, so 100 C is 10 squared. Hands of new age crystal, so let me... Uh... <laughs> 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 